So a lot of people have asked me to check out a game called Bleeding Blades. I went into it expecting something like Blade of Honor with maybe a couple elements from Blood and Iron. But what I ended up getting was something else entirely. What's going on guys, Kick Gaming here, and today I'm going to be reviewing Bleeding Blades, a fairly new war game featuring battles from 480 BC to 312 AD. The game takes heavy inspiration from Blood and Iron, but instead of shooting Europeans with silly hats, you're stabbing Mediterraneans with even sillier hats. <laughs> The gameplay and objectives are structured in a similar way, where both teams spawn on opposite sides of the map and try to completely wipe each other out within the time limit. While it may resemble Blood and Iron in many aspects, Bleeding Blade stands out in its superb execution of the format. What do I mean by this? Well, let's take a look. Bleeding Blades boasts three different maps, each of which has a simple yet robust design. First off is the Siege of Halicarnassus. Halicarnassus. Halkarnassus. Halkarnassus. In this battle, the Persian team has to hold the walls against the invading Macedonians, who have an arsenal of siege engines to thwart the defenders. As the attacking team, your objective is to push through the withering hail of the defenders' arrows and use the battering ram, siege towers, or ladders to enter the city and kill the enemy. Both sides are provided with artillery that can be used to destroy portions of the wall or the siege towers. If the match hasn't ended by the 10 minute mark, then all the dead players will be respawned. Personally, I think the defenders have a slight advantage on this map because they got archers, which can be crazy overpowered. Got him! Dude, I am basically Chris Kyle at this point, alright? Don't even, don't even try. Don't even try to invade my city, okay? Don't even try, get your ankle shot! Overall, I'd say that this map offers a lot of variation when it comes to tactics and the outcome's always up in the air. 7 out of 10 arrow storms. Next up is the Battle of Thermopylae, which is famous for its portrayal by A-list actor Tom Cruise in his award-winning film Gladiator. On the Spartan side, you got powerhouses like Loki, Fishman, and Russell Crowe. They're going up against walking jewelry store Xerxes and his legions of pajama-clad smurfs and archers. The battlefield is simple. You push through the enemy or you get pushed into the sea. Spicing things up is a narrow ravine through the cliffs that provides a flanking potential for anyone strong enough to control it. It's a very simple design that forces both teams to meet each other head on instead of relying on fancy equipment or defensive structures. It's chaotic, it's intense, and it's dynamic. This map has a lot of potential for pure, high-speed action. 4 out of 5 Liam Neesons. Finally, we've got the Battle of Milvian Bridge. See these guys? Chumps, all of them. They're taking a backseat because it's time to let the big boys play. Boom, the Roman Empire has entered the scene. Oh, are we Rome? Heck yeah! Yo, they got bears on their heads, that's awesome! These dudes got the best swords, the coolest armor, and the most stylish headgear. They're really the best part about this map because the actual layout is a bit lacking. In theory, an impassable river split by a single bridge would make a great battlefield, but for some reason or another, the game creators saw fit to make one team spawn way closer to said bridge than the other. If they fix this one flaw, I think this would be my favorite map. Even in its current state, the bridge isn't that bad. I think that I see more one-on-one -on -one combat here than at Thermopylae or the Siege of Halicarnassus, so I still have fun. Three square meters of bear skin out of... uh... more than that. There aren't any predefined classes, so I'm going to talk about equipment instead. The spear has been referred to as the King of Weapons. It's no surprise then that it serves as the soldier's primary tool in Bleeding Blades. Typically, the spears in this game offer greater range than swords and work better in group formations. Some variations include the Sarissa, a pike-like weapon that has a very long reach but can't be used in conjunction with a shield, and the Pylum, a Roman javelin that does abysmal damage when used in melee but performs well when thrown. Everyone knows what a sword is, I'm not going to insult your intelligence. In this game, swords are usually relegated to sidearms, serving as a backup weapon once your spear's been thrown. Swords offer more options in attack direction at the cost of range and damage. The one exception to this rule is the Roman Spatha, which can pack a significant punch. Some infantry and sappers get axes, which basically function like swords. They've got decent performance. 
Bows are unique to the Persian Empire in this game, and they can be a serious force to be reckoned with. While they might not inflict the most damage, bows can be used to soften up the enemy while they approach or to take advantage of an ongoing fight and cause some small-scale mutilation. The Plumbata is a hand-thrown dart given to Rhine legionaries. It doesn't do much damage, but you get four of them, so I don't know, maybe it's as good as a pylum? Finally, we have the Banner. It's not really supposed to be used as a weapon, but come on, you're full of bloodlust and you're wearing the head of a bear. Of course you're going to use it as a weapon. It has terrible damage, but can knock people down for a few seconds, so it's not entirely useless. Too many games try to implement a directional combat system, but can't quite pull it off. And I think that it gives this style of gameplay a bad rap. I'm pleased to say that Bleeding Blades gets it right and the whole game is better because of it. Every action forces you to make decisions based on all kinds of tactical trade-offs. Should I throw my spear and stunt my melee potential? Should I stow my shield so I can attack from different directions but leave myself vulnerable? Should I go on the offensive or wait for my opponent to make the first move? Every little decision contributes to the team's overall performance. Shields are extremely important if you don't want your guts to get poked. They block attacks from every direction and stun opponents who hit them. However, your shield can only take so much punishment before it breaks and you're left wide open to attack. It's important to time your thrusts and blocks in a way that maximizes damage, but also keeps you protected. As far as group tactics go, organized formations are a rare sight. Every once in a while, a rudimentary shield wall will form, but by and large, it's every man for himself. And the greatest battlefield advantage lies in the power of the mob. Huge clusters of players will swallow up and destroy any stragglers or smaller groups of enemies. And I've found that the best strategy is to try to consolidate your forces at all times to keep the numbers advantage. Sappers can build structures, much like in Blood and Iron, to fortify key locations and slow down the enemy, giving you time to organize and prepare. Bleeding Blades really shines for me in the little things. The stuff that might fly under the casual player's radar, but still contributes to the overall experience. I'm going to shoot off a rapid fire list of some of these features that I've noticed. The models and meshes are all unique. The metal on helmets, weapons, and shields reflect sunlight. Your weapon gets bloodier and bloodier the more people you kill with it. The maps look super crisp. The R15 models make dead players ragdoll way better than in games like Blood and Iron. You can remove your helmet with T and throw it at people. There's even a badge for getting a kill this way. Clicking on a player's name in the tablets will show you how many kills they have and which badges they've earned. Badges can be displayed by your name in the tablets to show off the cool things you've done. Victories are specified as decisive, close, or pyrrhic based on how many players are left alive. When a battle begins, a little text blurb will show up at the bottom of your screen detailing the objective, but on the siege map it's like an entire paragraph that's way too small to read before it disappears. Dead bodies will have excise or blood dribbling from their mouth. You aren't able to attack through walls or allies, and your cursor will turn black or green respectively if you try to. You can perform voice taunts with V. Why do they have Mordhau voice taunts? That doesn't even fit the theme. They got the Swiss cheese one! <laughs> Swiss cheese hasn't even been invented yet, silly. Fall damage is a serious risk, especially on the siege map. Where are the rest of these fools at? Oh god! Oh, my legs! There's an easy to use vote kick system, which we may take for granted, but think about how long it took Blood and Iron to get one of those. Some of the social aspects of Blood and Iron carried over too. Yeah, you kill that surrendered. You show him what for. Yo, they got teabagging down. Bro, I do not care if you're surrendered. Get back here. Out of here, Echo. Of course, no game is perfect and Bleeding Blades is no exception. There are some aspects that can be a bit annoying. Firstly, remember that one time when I said that a major factor in my class choice was how good the uniform looked? Well, throw that mentality right out the window, because nearly every uniform in this game looks utterly ridiculous. What is this hat? Why? <laughs> I look like a smurf wearing this hat. Player movement in general is a bit janky, and you might have trouble with ladders and stairs. The walking sound is always a loud stomping, which I know is supposed to simulate actual marching, but it does get on my nerves after a while. While the rounds are the same length as Blood and Irons, they feel a bit longer if you die in the very beginning. This is probably just a psychological thing, I don't know. Finally, there's a zoom in feature that activates when you hit the shift key. This can be handy for range classes, but for everyone else it's just annoying. Especially when I expect shift to make me sprint. That one's easy enough to get over though. 
Overall, I'd say this game is a lot of promise. It takes a familiar format and polishes it till it shines. It's only a few months old and can already stand on its own. I'm eager to see what the future holds for Bleeding Blades. As of now, I'd rate it 7.5 out of 10. Hey, welcome to the outro. If you like this video, do me a favor, thumbs up the video. If you want to see more reviews, subscribe. If you don't want to see more reviews, subscribe anyway. Make sure to comment your thoughts down below and share this video with a friend if you think they might like it. Thank you so much for watching. Ski Gaming, signing out. Goodbye. Uh-oh, 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 uh-oh. Oh no, excuse me, sir. I just gotta get out the door here. Just, uh, don't mind me, just gonna climb these here stairs, old boy, oh... Alright, you wanna go? Fine, let's go, let's go, let's dance, huh? You can take me. Okay.